amongst other things, I design typefaces. Um, when I started, it was analog, and now digitization has brought the tools to everybody. You can make a typeface. Anybody can make a typeface. Whether that's going to be good or bad is another thing. Like anybody can program. You know, if you, you can learn to program, that's not going to be good, but you can learn it. So these days, every young designer, male or female, anywhere in the world, does design his or her own typeface. It's one of those exercises like, you know, 20 years ago you would do your own painting or, or your own drawing or whatever, now you design a typeface. And then you realize it's difficult and boring and then you stop doing it. But you can do it, the tools are there. But essentially, we're, we're still designing what they designed 500 years ago. That was obviously the best model ever. So all the good typefaces today look almost like they did 500 years ago. The most um, mistakes people make is trying to have a preconceived physical idea of a typeface. They want to make a typeface out of uh, key rings, out of twigs, out of snow crystals, out of uh, triangles and squares. It doesn't work. Type comes from handwriting, and it, which was frozen 500 years ago into the, the, the Venetian Antiqua, which we still read best, or even Helvetica is Venetian Antiqua with the, the bits cut off, sort of the, the simple sack dress as it were. And uh, it still has a rhythm of, of, of writing in it. A good typeface reads well because it, we can feel there's a hand behind it. If it becomes too mechanical, and that's the mistake a lot of people make because of course it's much easier to design a typeface as mechanical. You just put shapes together, but they, they're not successful. What we read uh, are typefaces that are actually quite complex, they don't, but the, the art is its so small that you don't see the complexity. It disappears. It's very much like you know, whatever dress you're wearing, nobody's going to take a large uh, view of, of the wool in there but it makes a difference whether it's wool or nylon, not from the distance, but for the wearer. The same goes for type. The, the details are incredibly important, but they're invisible. The media, in, of course, informs the, the shape of the typeface. Uh, if you're designing something for a large sign or, or, or to be printed on a very small book, it has to look a little different. The, the, the difference between screen and paper is pretty much gone because modern screens are as good if not better than paper. The one difference is that you will always look into a light source. A screen always has a light looking back at you. So there's more contrast than our eye likes. So the, the whole art is to make the type a little softer, which a lot of screen designers haven't understood yet, but they will do. In other words, again, something that worked well in a book 500 years ago works really well on a modern screen. Uh, and people are beginning to realize that we need to add a bit of noise to make it warm and not to talk about the medium, to talk about the text and the reader. That's much more important. Well, people always, you know, we always have the tendency to make something that's universal. We want to make the one suit, the one pair of socks, the one pair of shoes, uh, the one car, you know, the Volkswagen, whatever. But this is not our human nature. We want uh, variety, we want choices, and everybody's handwriting is different. If you design a typeface, if you got the same model to design from that I did, we would look different, because our hands and eyes experiences are different. So that, that is an expression of the people who do it, but it's also an expression for the text. If I, if I pick a text that Alex has written, uh, I'll give it a different typeface than a text that you would write, because the content is different. So the type is the voice of the text and the voices have to be appropriate. So that's why there's room for a few thousand typefaces. I, I do both. I, I like analog tools and I do screen tools. Obviously, uh, the ultimate uh, typeface will be a font, will be a piece of data, bits and, you know, bits and, uh, and, and uh, zeros and ones. But you approach the issue, most of these type designers I know, by sketching, by drawing a little notebooks. It's only for me, I kind of know what I mean. And then you move it into the digital realm, just like a lot of authors still write with a fountain pen or on a typewriter or whatever. And then when you translate it into the digital or into the black and white technical medium, it changes a little bit. When I read my own text printed out, I read it differently from my handwriting. And when I see my own typefaces on screen, I realize it's maybe wrong, I need to change it. So the medium does change your perception, and so you have to go back and forth all the time. Yeah, I said the retina display or the high-res displays, they change it because they become too sharp for the human eye. There's too much detail there and it glares at you. It's not very healthy, as any doctor would tell you, or as, you, as your headache would tell you at night, to look into that light all day. Because it's a light. It's like me looking at that light all day long. It makes you stupid. That's why it's so nice to go, go back in the evening and, and read a book where you lean back, you don't lean forward, because we lean forward all day long, your neck hurts. Reading a book or magazines where you lean back, you look at a slightly longer distance, you read more at once, and there's less contrast. It's much, much healthier. That's why printed media will never, ever go away, because it's more human. I can't make a prediction of what comes next because I can tell you something about the future.
it's ahead of us. That's all I know. Other, everything else will be totally stupid.